I'll just make sure my volume is down. Yeah, good. Okay. And got it. And now we're live. Okay. Well, um, hello everybody. And if you are watching from Facebook and you want to join us, I'm going to put the, the Zoom link underneath the post so you're very welcome to come and join us in the zoom or you can continue to watch on on facebook um, we are very very blessed today to have our most favorite speaker mr Leung, to speak once again on a topic of theory um, as you can see he's he's one of our most qualified members holding his fellowship from the ABRSM and um, a very experienced theory teacher. So I look forward to what you have to share with us tonight. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. So welcome everyone. Today I'm going to talk about transposition and what do you need to know for um, music theory exams? Because many of my students who are teachers themselves, um, they are confused about transposition. So if you understand everything from the ground up, you'll be less likely to make a mistake. So uh, why do we have transposing instruments? It really doesn't make sense, right? Like if, if an instrument plays a note from the music and it sounds something else. So the reason for that is, for example, for wooden instruments, we have a family of instruments of different sizes. Say these are clarinets. And you have a small clarinet, a less small clarinet, regular size clarinet, something a little bit bigger, something rather bigger, and something much bigger. And they are like scale copies of one another. It's like a model cars, right? You have 1 to 24, 1 to 32, 1 to 8 different sizes, but they have the same shapes, they, they sound similar. So for what means, like uh, for clarinet, if you have a shorter instrument, then the sound is going to come out uh, higher. And when you have a longer instrument, the sound is going to come out uh, lower. So to be precise, if you have an instrument that's twice the length, you get an octave lower. And if you have an instrument, that's half the length, you get an octave higher. And if the instrument is 50% longer, you get a perfect fifth lower. So you have two choices uh, in this case for playing a family of instruments. Either you learn a different set of fingering for each indi uh, individual member of the family, or you use the same fingering for every instrument of the family. So if you want to use a different set of fingerings for each individual instrument in the family, then you have uh, how many we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different sizes of clarinet, right? So it's a rather big task to memorize eight sets of fingerings for essentially the same instrument. So a easier way would be for you to just learn one set of fingerings and apply that to all the members of the family. So what do I mean by that? So for clarinet in C, if you leave everything open, it sounds the G above the middle C. But for a clarinet in B flat, if you leave everything open, you get an F which is a major second lower than the G that, that uh, you get from the clarinet in C. And similarly, if you play everything open on the A clarinet, you get an E. So if you just learn the fingerings of the C clarinet and assume that when you play everything open, it is a G, then you don't have to remember anything else, right? You just pick up a different size of clarinet and you play the same way and it's easy. Except that there's a little bit of a problem. If the clarinet is not a clarinet in C, if it is a bigger clarinet or a smaller clarinet, the note that comes out is different. So you can't play in tune with other people, which is a big problem. So how do you solve the problem? Well, you know 
how what's what's the difference between the two clarinets? Say if you play the clarinet in B flat, you know everything is going to come out a major second lower than uh, on the clarinet uh, clarinet in C. So you can pre move the music up a major second. Then when you play uh, what's on the page, everything will come out a major second lower, so everything will cancel out. So this is why we have transposing instruments. Transposing instruments, at least for woodwinds, comes from the fact that there are different members in the family of that particular, uh, particular instrument. And you want to use just one set of fingerings for all different sizes of that instrument. And to accomplish that, you have to transpose the music the opposite way in advance so that the pitch pitches that come out is uh, they are correct. So if the uh, instrument is an octave, sounding an octave lower than the regular member of the family, you have to transpose the music up an octave. And if the instrument is, say, uh, a perfect fifth higher than the regular member, then you have to transpose the music a perfect fifth lower than uh, what's actually sounding. So uh, this is an excerpt from uh, Ravel's orchestration of Busovsky's pictures as an exhibition. And you can see that uh, these, these are the woodwinds and, and, um, and the horns and symbols. Right? So the key signature has six flats. But for, for the clarinet, it only has four flats. It's because uh, at this moment, the B flat clarinet is used. And when you transpose the music up in major second, you knock off two flats. And that's one of the main reasons that why composers wrote for the B flat clarinet and the A clarinet. Because in the old days, it was rather difficult to play sharps or flats on a clarinet. And it certainly didn't sound good. So it was advantageous to have fewer flats or fewer sharps in the music for clarinet. So when there was uh, a piece of music in a flat key like this, it would be um, normal to use the B for clarinet and the B flat bass clarinet. And uh, by the same token, if you have a piece of music in a sharp key, you would have been better to use an A clarinet. And you need to know the transposition because if you don't see, get to see the first page of the score, you only get to see uh, this particular page. It doesn't tell you what clarinet is using, right? It just says CL, which stands for clarinet. So you have to look at the key signature and see how is it different from that of the non-transposing instruments. And then find out, okay, this must have been the B flat clarinet. And that's why the music is transposed up a major second. And here is another example. This is from the second movement of Imzikosikov's Capriccio Espanol. And in this case, the A clarinet is used in, for this movement. And you can see that it's rather clumsy because the music itself already has one flat, it's in F major. And by using the A clarinet, actually you don't knock off three sharps, you add three flats. Removing three sharps is the same as adding three flats. And in a flat key, if you use an instrument in a sharp key, then you get more flats. But Vincent Kosovo wasn't that stupid. He did it for a reason. So, but I'm just trying to show you that if you use the wrong instrument, you get into more trouble. And um, you can see that the, the horns are in F here, and the trumpet is in B flat. Well, you may ask me, hey, uh, it, it says uh, it is in B. Why do you say it's in B flat? Well, that's because 
English actually had no status in classical music, right? For a long time, classical music was dominated by the Italians and the French and the Germans. And the Italians and French, they use uh, sofa names for note names. So if you see note names in English, or oh, sorry, in, in letters, that's uh, almost 100% in German. And in German, B means uh, B flat. And B natural would be written as an H or H in, in uh, German uh, pronunciation. So here is uh, the first page of uh, the Jig by uh, Code WC. And you can see that uh, there are quite a few transposing instruments here. You have a core on gay or English horn. So you can see there's a one fewer flat than usual because the core on gay is in F. So you knock up one flat. And WC used clarinet in B flat so that you get two flats instead of four flats in the key signature. But he also wanted the tone color of the Obo d'Amour. And the Obo d'Amour was built in, or is built in the key of A. So from four flats, you actually get to seven flats for the Obo d'Amour. And to make it easier to read for, for the player, um, Debussy wrote in five sharps instead. Because in with seven flats, you are in C, uh, C flat major, which is the anharmonic of B major. And that's a really good trick for you to remember that if you use the enharmonic key, the sum of the flats and the sharps should be 12, which is the number of semitones in an octave. So seven flats is the same as five sharps, and six flats is the same as six sharps. F sharp major, G flat major, right? The two keys are the same. So if you want to flip over to the, to the other side and use sharps instead of flats, you just have to subtract the number of sharps or flats uh, from 12 and you, you get the answer. And you may want to ask me, hey, you, you say uh, when the instrument is in F, you knock off two flats, right? So how, how come the horns in F, they knock off all the flats? Doesn't really make sense, does it? Well, that's, that's uh, because of the historical reason. So in the old days, before the uh, Industrial Revolution, this is how the horn looked like. It was just a uh, one continuous tubing with an interchangeable section uh, called the crook, so that you can insert a different length of the crook here to make the horn shorter or longer. And you can only play a limited number of notes in that case. For example, if you use the C crook with a fundamental of a low C, these are all the notes that you can play. Uh, I'm, I'm saying natural harmonics, uh, not uh, if you use the hand to stop the bell, that, that's a different story. From the, but the natural harmonics are only these. And all of these, uh, some of these are, are not in tune. Say the seventh harmonic and the 14th harmonic are 31 cents flat on the uh, uh, equal time moment system. That means it's 31% of a semitone low. That, that's almost a quarter tone low, right? So not really that useful. And the 11th harmonic and the 13th harmonic are really not musical notes. This is really in between F natural and F sharp. And the 13th harmonic is really in between A flat and A. But the natural horn player or natural trumpet player would have known these are all of two notes, right? So they look at the harmonic series these represent more than just pitches. They look at this series and know which notes are not really usable in a ensemble setting. And if you have a slightly shorter set of uh, uh, tubing with a fundamental of D instead, you get these harmonics. Everything is shifted 
of a major second compared to this set of harmonics. And the out of tune notes remain out of tune. Now those are still the seventh harmonic, the 14th, the 11th, and the 13th. So it was customary for composers to notate the music without key signature and set everything in the home key of the instrument. So everything would be in C. They would say horn in F, but you read in C, and these are all the notes that, that uh, you are expected to play. And there's only one, uh, uh, two B flats here, which are out of tune and you don't use them often. So that's why there was no need for a key signature, right? Because it is in C major and there's no sharps and no flats in the notes that you produce. And this practice continued well into the 20th century. So you can see that uh, Debussy, he wrote the jig in, uh, from between 1909 and 1912. And he notated the horn, horns in the old notation, right? No key signature. But the trumpet had the key signature. So it was maybe the transition period. But if we look, uh, go back to, uh, to the uh, Ravel, the um, pictures and an exhibition, which was arranged in 1922, 10 years after the WC. He was still using no key signature for both horns and trumpets. Even though that he, he already noted that the horns has chromatic horn in F, that means those horns had valves and they, um, those horns could play the full chromatic range. Still, he was using the uh, old notation with no key signature. So that's why you cannot really tell what key the instrument is from the key signature if uh, these are horns and trumpets. It's really, really dangerous to just go with the key signature and say, oh, there's, not, there's um, uh, nothing here, so it must be in F or it must be in C. You, you, can't, you can't go with that. So let's look at more examples of transposing instrument. So this is, uh, again, from the pictures at an exhibition as orchestrated by Maurice Ravel. Uh, second movement, Il Vecchio Castello, the old castle. So this movement is in G sharp minor with five sharps, right? And you can see that the core and clay has six flats. So why is that? Well, when you have a instrument in F, you knock off one flat. And in this case, you have five sharps. So you don't knock off any flat, you add one sharp, which is uh, six sharps. And for some reason, I, I think uh, many composers, they think flats are easier to read than sharps, so for particularly for woodwinds. So instead of notating the English horn part in six sharps, uh, Ravel wrote six flats. And uh, he was smart enough to use the A clarinet, so uh, knock off three sharps, only two sharps, easier to play, maybe slightly better to, uh, to listen to also, and bass clarinet also in A, right? But um, the bass cabinet in A is obsolete now because the production volume doesn't really um, warrant the continuous production. So nowadays the bass cabinet parts in, in A um, almost always taken over by bass cabinet in B flat. So the player will have to, to transpose as sight by semitone, which is not that easy. And this is an interesting example. You have a solo, right? This is a famous solo for the alto saxophone in, in E flat, which is sounding a major six lower. So how do you transpose it? When you have an instrument in E flat, you should knock off three flats. Or if you think of a G sharp minor, if you go up a major six, that's, uh, that becomes an E sharp minor, right? But E sharp minor doesn't really exist, or at least we are not that familiar with it. When you have the five sharps and you have to add three more sharps, that becomes eight sharps, or rather six sharps and one double sharp. And you don't read claps like that. 
So what do you do? Well, A sub is the same as four flats, right? You add up uh, the, uh, the enharmonics, you add up to 12. So E sub minor becomes F minor, four flats. So this is what the uh, saxophone player is going to read. So instead of transposing the music up a major six, actually you are transposing the ma uh, music up a diminished seventh. But you really don't have any recalls. You, that, that's the only way you can do it. And this is not academic. Actually, uh, a few years ago, there was a similar question in one of the um, uh, grade eight, uh, ABISM grade eight music theory uh, papers that required you to go from many shops to uh, quite a few flats or, or, or the other way, I, I don't remember. So you really, really need to know this if you want to tackle uh, all cases. So um, just a recap, for woodwinds, the primary instrument is non-transposing. So flute is non-transposing, oboe is non-transposing, clarinet in C is non-transposing, and bassoon is non-transposing. And all the auxiliary woodwind instruments are transposing because they are not the same uh, size as the primary, right? So for piccolo, which is half the length of the flute, uh, the music is, I mean, is sounding an octave higher than, than written. So the music is transposed down an octave. And for the alto flute in G, which uh, sounds a perfect fourth lower than written, the music is written a perfect fourth higher. So for big instrument, the music is written higher than it should be. And for small instruments, the music is written uh, lower than it should be. But there's one exception, which is the bass clarinet. You can see uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, this is from a good demo by Richard Wagner. And you, you can see there's a bass clarinet in B flat here, in bass clef. When the uh, bass clarinet part is written in bass clef, it's called the German, notation, uh, German notation. So it's no longer written a major ninth higher than, than sounding. It's only written a major second higher than sounding. So the reference would be a some instrument that's uh, like a bass kind of in C in that case. So you really, really have to be careful when you interpret uh, bass kind of parts because some uh, composers, they mix the French notation, which is the triple clef notation with the German notation. And that, that gets really confusing. Or, or maybe a piece of music uh, starts with the German notation and then it goes too high, it goes to the, you need to use the treble clef and you have to mentally switch, right? So you really, really have to be careful. So, uh, so for trombone and for tuba, those two instruments have never been transposing instruments, uh, at least in the orchestra. Uh, you may ask, why is that, right? Well, the trombone had had a slide from its birth, so it was always able to play chromatic notes. So it was not necessary to build trombones in different keys, as was the case for horns and trumpets. So from, from the beginning, trombones uh, were treated as a non-transposing instrument. Even though there were there were different sets of trombones, like alto trombone, tenor trombone, and bass trombone. So trombone players had to use different slide positions for the same note. They don't have the luxury of using the same technique for, for, for all sizes of instruments. And tuba was invented uh, in the middle of the 19th century. So by that time, uh, they, uh, it came with the vowels, right? Uh, at, at, uh, at this invention. So it was able to play all the chromatic notes. So even though there, are, there have been different sizes of, of, uh, sizes of tuba, in the orchestra, the tuba was always treated as a non-transposing instrument. So the tuba player will have to use different fingerings if he or she uses a different size of tuba. 
So that's important to remember. And for the horn, there's another complication. In the old days, that means before the uh, 20th century, it was customary for the uh, horn music to be notated one octave too low if it is in the bass clef. So what do I mean by that? Say if you are writing the music for horn in F, which sounds a perfect fifth lower than, than written, you have to transpose the music up a perfect fourth. But in the bass clef, you don't transpose the music up a perfect fourth. You transpose the, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I said wrong. In the treble clef, you transpose the music up a perfect fifth. Sorry, uh, my mistake. But in the bass clef, they didn't do that. They transpose the music down a perfect fourth. Or you can think of it as transposing the music up a perfect fifth and then put it an octave lower. I don't know why that was the case, but that was the case for until the 1900, and some composers used that even well into the 20th century. So in this case, again from the Maurice Ravel's uh, uh, orchestration of the pictures and exhibition, he put wheel height or wheel uh, pitch, right? So that means this is a new notation. This is a wheel deal. You, you, the music is written a perfect fifth higher than, than sounding, not a perfect fourth lower. Right? And then he felt the need to, to say that. That means at the time there were uh, other people who, who did it the old way, right? And, and to really figure out, you really need to know the range of the horn to, to know for sure. And e even if you know the range of the horn, you may not know for sure. So there is a minefield out there. It is really, really dangerous. But the good thing is, I haven't seen ABRSM asking you that without telling you whether it's the old notation or the new notation. I haven't seen it. But I don't know whether uh, they, it's like a volcano, right? It, it hasn't erupted for a long time. Maybe it's dormant. Or maybe it's going to erupt uh, pretty soon. So you really can't take it for granted that they're not going to ask you. Or as a practical musician, you should know, right? If you are a conductor and if you don't know, then you, you'll be a laughing stock of the officer. That's for sure. So now we move on to the uh, string instrument family. There's one transposing member of the string instrument family, which is a double bass. So the double bass sounds an octave lower than written. So why is that? Well, I can't, I can't go back and ask the compo uh, composers, why is that? But I have my feeling, I, I have my guess. Before Beethoven's time, in, uh, in, uh, when the double bass is used in the orchestra, it's always used to double the cello uh, in the octave below. So cello and bass, they share the same staff. So really, the bass is not really playing the uh, the rhythm pitch. It's doubling the cello melody an octave lower. So it made it made sense in two ways for it to be a transposing instrument. One one is that you save paper. You don't have to make another staff, right? Paper was precious. And in the old days, I, I heard that it took uh, the lives of more than four hundred goats to to make a Bible. Right? You have to you have to kill so many goats to. To, to skin the instrument to, to make the paper. So uh, it would have been better to, to make the score more compact. And also the conductor wouldn't have to, to uh, turn so many pages. And also, right, uh, the double bass, if it's used to double the treble melody, really, I mean, you, you don't want to read the actual depth of the melody, you want to read like this, you don't want to have so many ledger lines and for it to, to look so low. You are prone to making more mistakes and it doesn't really make sense. So this is why I think it has been a transposing instrument. For percussion, uh, the rule of thumb is, if something sounds shrill or high, then it is a transposing instrument. And you need to know that the xylophone sounds an octave higher, and the cockenspiel, which sounds even more shrill, 
songs to octaves higher. And many candidates got tripped by, by this in, uh, in the exam, um, I think the last section of exam uh, last year, because uh, the question was, uh, is it true that the Gorkans view sounds an octave higher than, than written? Well, it's not true. It doesn't sound an octave higher. It sounds two octaves higher. And again, right, these instruments are kind of for color purpose. It's like a double bass, but the opposite way. They don't really play the melody. They kind of support the melody uh, at an octave higher. It's like a piccolo, right? Usually supports the melody, but sounds an octave higher. So again, it makes sense to not to have to read so many ledger lines and, and for you to really hear what the real melody is. So I think that's why these uh, uh, mallet uh, instruments are transposed uh, down an octave or down two octaves because they are so high and they're for color purpose and, and it's easier to read like that. And I, I forgot to put on my slides, but uh, Celeste, which is kind of the keyboard version of Cocktonspiel, is also a transposing instrument, sounding an octave higher than written. So I think uh, that's what I have for today um, before, before the question section. So maybe uh, we can open up the floor to, to anyone who may have questions on transposition, and I'll try my best to answer. I think, oh, I should add a spotlight. Sorry, everyone, it is hot. Um, yeah, I've added a spotlight. I think I, I came to this session not expecting to learn anything that surprised me. And, and it was so fascinating to learn about the crooks and the reasons behind the, the why things are transposed with key signatures and why they're not. So I think that I'm going to be recommending when my students come back and watch this because I'd never seen a crook, even though, of course, I've done it in theory, but never actually conceived what that meant. So thank you so much for... You, you're probably seeing many crooks, but not the musical type. <laughs> yes, this is a good point. But the, yeah, that was fascinating and fascinating about the change in um, the old and the new ways of transposition and things I hadn't come across before. So thank you for being so enlightening. Now I'll remove my spotlight in case anybody else has a question. And let me just make it so people can unmute. So if you have a question, you're welcome to ask it in the chat. Oh, there are chats. There are chats. Um, Rob K has said the primary clarinet is the pair B flat A and the C is rarely used. Now, Rob, I have to tell you, my C clarinet is my favorite. I do not rarely use the C clarinet. I use it the most because I hate transposing. I just, I have perfect pitch and it annoys me <laughs> when something's transposed. But yeah, I know I'm weird and everybody well, else. It, it's true for the 20th century, but back in the 18th century, the 19th century, that wasn't always the case. Say if you play the Beethoven symphony, many of them were written for the uh, C clarinet. And also uh, Rossini opera, even as late as uh, the third quarter of the 19th century, like uh, uh, Lava, uh, um, the uh, Moda by Smetana, right? Mm -hmm. Most of it was written for the C clarinet. So the C clarinet came along first. That's why it was the primary instrument. And then B flat clarinet and the A clarinet came along later. So the primary instrument today is, was not the primary instrument back then. And the people can't can change history, right? So that's the uh, only exception that the primary instrument in the Rubin family that is a transposing instrument. So the Mozart um, clarinet concerto, which uses the Bassett clarinet, was that a C clarinet? It was an A clarinet. Oh, it was an A clarinet, okay. The C clarinet sound, sounded quite bright, still sounds bright. So over time, people or composers gravitated uh, towards the B flat clarinet and the A clarinet. And also those enabled, to, enabled you to play uh, the difficult keys more easily, right? So uh, I think by both reasons, they, they kind of took over. So any other questions on... Either I, I must have explained myself really poorly, so you don't know what to ask or I'm uh, uh, explain everything clear. There's nothing. Rob has put it at 
comment, the reason the different clarinet exists is the difference in tone. The A flat and the B flat have the nicest tone, the C is shrill, and the E flat is even worse. And um, I will I will add to that, Rob, that my clarinet teacher had to quit. I should spotlight myself, shouldn't I? Because I'm talking, but now I can't find myself to spotlight. Um, my clarinet teacher had to quit performing because he had developed tinnitus from playing E flat in the orchestra. And um, so basically being under the stage in the, in the pit, um, sorry, I'm trying to see everyone, there we go, so I can see Rob. Um, being under, uh, in the pit playing the E flat, he gave himself tinnitus. So, yeah, um, he's very, a, he's very a, sad. He's, so, he's really a weapon of mass dysfunction. I mean, uh, not, not, not just a player, even players around the E flat clarinetus, uh, they, they, they are suffering, right? So, well, that's a good lesson to anybody in the room who's a student listening that ear protection is important even on instruments like violin which the, the because the violin is here because i can see a violin player the violin is here and so the sound is directly in your left ear so even just to wear an ear plug in this ear can protect your hearing if you're practicing for more than an hour a day so it's just an eight after 80 decibels you need to start thinking about ear protection so that's a good yeah. sidetrack um, off topic. Yeah, actually, you know, um, uh, it's quite interesting. Maybe a little bit of a detour, but I can I can tell you a story. So I met the one of the principal uh, cello players from the Vienna Philharmonic. So I asked him, right, "Well, your orchestra played in different sitting arrangements depending on the music, right? So what was your favorite? Like, where do you like to sit?" He said, "Well, I, I don't care so long as I don't sit in front of the trumpet or the timpani." So that's what he said. And, and I, I play many instruments, but I don't want to. I, I don't want to play the bassoon in an orchestra purely because I don't like, like to sit in front of the trumpets. Yeah. Apologies to any trumpet players here. Now Lloyd has just asked for clarification. Why does the key signature change when transposing? Well, uh, say if you have a piece of music in C major, right, and you are using a B flat clarinet to play that piece of music. You have to move the music up a major second for uh, so that the music will come out even because your instrument is making the music sounding a major second lower. So if you go here, right? If you move the uh, if you move the C to a D and you have to move the uh, D to an E, right? And then the third note of the scale, the E, you move to the F sharp. If you don't move to the F sharp, it's not a correct relation. Because you have to move everything up a major second. And uh, you cannot preserve all the flats or all the sharps when you do that. So the E becomes an F sharp when you transpose up. And similarly, the B becomes a C sharp when you transpose up a major second. So uh, the C major becomes D major, which carries two sharps. So you can you can think of it uh, as a key signature, or you can look at the, in the individual pictures, and they both come out the same, if you do it correctly, that is. So when you transpose, the, the key signature always changes, unless you don't use key signature at all, like the case for, for brass instruments. Then, then there's nothing to worry about on this end, but you have to worry about the individual pictures. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. So any other questions? Yeah, don't be shy, right? Just, uh, just ask. Any any questions on the on the Facebook feed? Uh, uh -huh. There's a thank you. There's there's a thank you. <laughs> there's no you've had about between five and ten people watching on Facebook. So yes, yes. Uh, so Rob, uh, good good point. Right? I didn't want to confuse uh, the uh, listeners uh, because uh, for many people this is already confusing enough. So in uh, British brass band, the trombone is actually treated as a transposing instrument, uh, sounding a major ninth below written uh, as a music uh, as an instrument in b flat but since uh, not that many people play in the british past 
a brass band. I thought I didn't have to uh, to mention it. It does come up. Some of our kids are, are learning at school and they're learning with transposing and then they've got to come into ABRSM as orchestral music is treated differently. So it's a good thing to mention. Yeah, but, but the British brass band has never been asked on the ABRSM theory paper, at least for the uh, papers that I've seen from the 80s and 90s and and um, the new millennium, they have never asked that. And it's not even with, um, mentioned in any of the theory material. So I don't think people have to worry about answering that. Rob has added that the reason there are, two, which I think you just said anyway, the reason for the two different transposing methods is the difference tradition. So the brass band versus the orchestra, and that it's not only British, but it's a European military tradition that is mm. involved here. So any other questions? Well, Rob, Rob is welcome to talk. You don't, you don't have to type, but then I'm happy to be on live stream embarrassing myself of typing and <laughs> talking. <laughs> Shall I, shall I add a spotlight on you, Rob? Oh, I don't think you've got a microphone connected. Is that working? It is. Wait, let me add a spotlight on you. There we go. There's three of us spotlighted. <laughs> okay. Well, I actually had a question, um, and I, I've been uh, targeted uh, at both of you, actually. Because um, I'm primarily a singer. Um, do you, are there many uses for transposing um, in vocal repertory? Because I've, I've not really encountered them. Um, but in terms of theory, um, I'm not sure that there would be anything asked. Well, in uh, I think for uh, tenor, if the music is in treble clef, it's written and uh, occupied and written. So that's one case I can think of. And if they do it properly, they would put a um, small uh, number eight on at, at the uh, bottom of the triple clef. And I think for singers, right, usually transposing is the kind of the, the skill needed by the accompanist. Say the singer is feeling under the weather or not uh, up to the, <laughs> the music at that day, then the, the accompanist will have to transpose a site to, to, uh, to play in a different key. And, and then, too. not even that, just the fact that you have to match the piece to the, the student's range. So you have to transpose yeah. left, right and centre as the accompanist. It's annoying. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a really important skill to have. But nowadays you have computer software, you can just fit in the music and transpose whatever distance you want, right? And the music will come out in, in a minute. And I think maybe the skill is not as sought after than, than in the past. but. But still, I mean, it's always better if you can do it. Any other questions? I'll let Rob go back into hiding. <laughs> so, I think... uh, so I, I should thank uh, a few uh, individuals for, for the talk. So, uh, first of all, Sarah for inviting me and uh, giving the talk, and also uh, Ankubus Eng Smith, the horn uh, maker, for letting me uh, use that beautiful picture of a natural horn, and also uh, PNJ Music Publishing, uh, which uh, publishes music theory books in, in Chinese, and for letting me use the nice graphic. It say, saved me a lot of time. It would have taken me a long time to to draw something like this because I don't use any software. So uh, thank you for uh, helping me uh, preparing this talk. Thank you so much for what you shared today. As I said it wasn't it wasn't the direction I expected you to go, and I did definitely didn't expect to learn as much as I did. So um, thank you to, for everybody that is with us now, on behalf of everyone who's watching now, and those who watch later. Thank you so much for sharing expertise with us, and and um, giving us so much enlightening stuff that we can take back to our our students. Really appreciated. Well, thanks for coming. I hope I, everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Everybody else will announce on Facebook when the next Zoom will happen. Sorry, they're not quite as regular as they used to be, but um, it's great when we can have them and see everyone. So until next time, 
have a great Christmas. And, we'll and Merry see Christmas, everyone. And we'll see you then. Bye-bye.